può partire quando vuole. Ok, so welcome for this lecture by Professor Jean-Claude Guedon. Uh, professor Guedon is a professor at University of Mont Montreal in Canada, in Quebec. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him back in Torino uh, now, several times, uh, quite a number of times, um, for many reasons, not, not only because he's a friend, not only because he's a trustee of the Nexa Center for Internet Society, uh, but also, and it's the topic of the lecture today, because uh, he's the most important uh, thinkers uh, about uh, the open access movement. And very recently, uh, he wrote uh, uh, an important, in my opinion, uh, uh, article, uh, substantial article about the, I would say, the current state of open access in the last 10 years uh, and moving forward. Um, I remember part of the title, Internet of Minds, Tolbert's and Internet of Minds. Uh, which I strongly recommend that you read, not only for this lecture and for this course, but more broadly as um, uh, apprentice researchers, because it's very much about uh, the future of science, open access uh, as an integral part of the future of science. And um, it's, of course, freely available online. <laughs> and um, uh, so, uh, Jean-Claude Guidon, um, also in the previous years has given uh, lectures on, on this topic from different point of view. You find all the videos uh, on the, on the um, website of the PhD doctoral school at the Politecnico, but this time it's going to talk about, uh, well, we have uh, uh, Janus Bifrance uh, uh, on the front of the presentation, so we'll let him explain why he picked this, this picture. And uh, I'm deeply sorry that I would not be able to attend because in seven minutes, I have to handle a very large uh, written examination for the computer science course, so therefore I will not be able to be here. Uh, so I will leave Professor Guedon in the hands of my colleagues and friends uh, from the Nexa Center. Please be the, the master of ceremonies uh, for this lecture and for the following lecture. So, welcome back to Torino. Thank the you. floor is yours. We'll take it out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is that fun? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Juan Carlos. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back here in Turin. It's uh, one of my favorite cities, actually, if not uh, very, very much. Uh, one of the top five of the cities I like uh, in the world. And I've spent some very, very happy weeks here. So it's always really a pleasure to be back uh, in your fair town, as they say in English. Uh, I'm going to try talking to you about a, something which is happening right now, particularly at the level of governments. Um, practically every European government is involved in this kind of uh, debate. The European Union is very much involved with this. And you'll hear that as well in uh, North America, uh, perhaps in a less governmental manner, but around the universities and around the, uh, the uh, finance, funding agencies. Uh, a battle which really is um, what do these words that we use all the time really mean? And some of these words are words like sustainability, uh, competition, market, and so on, when applied to something which is extremely specific and to me not well suited for the use of such words, uh, the, the question, the issue of communication among researchers how they communicate, why they communicate, what do they do when they communicate, and why is it so important to science that they should communicate. So, to set the problem, I amused myself with this uh, old uh, ancient statue of the Janus B. France uh, to describe, in fact, what I think is really at the heart of the scientists. Actually, I would have liked to have a Janus three fronts uh, because there is a subset of uh, researchers who actually uh, should appear as well. We'll talk about them, but they are they are a much smaller set than uh, the rest, which actually uh, behaves in uh, two ways. So, why is the researcher B France? Well, essentially because he, he does two very different things most of the time. You've done it yourself. You seek information. You want information. You try to access information. You try to find where it is. You try to, to understand where it comes from. You try to interpret it. You try to see how to reuse it for your own work. You, you've done all of that. It's a 
it's really uh, one, one kind of task which actually probably takes somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of your total time because most of the time we work like that. Then once in a while when, when we have done enough of that, we decide that it's time to go to the other facet of our work, which is to say, oh, I can put all this that I found in a peculiar way and do something new and interesting with it and essentially produce knowledge. And I want to, of course, expose this knowledge to my colleagues. I want to show it to them. I want to publish as it is said. So here is the first phase. You recognize the the kind of work you do with or without a magnifying glass. I'll let you decide the kind of tools you want to use. And you do search almost anywhere. And I say that because when you search, if you find it through some, some means, if you find the right kind of article in some obscure journal, which is not even normally indexed or referenced in the normal thing, you're going to use it if the journal looks legitimate to you. If you think that the, the article is credible, trustworthy, and so on, you're going to use it. It may come out of Patagonia, it may come out of uh, in some uh, Zambia in Africa or somewhere, but if the article looks solid and interesting, you're not going to deprive yourself from, uh, from looking at these articles, which in passing raises a problem that we will not be dealing with today, but which is the filtering that the big bibliographies, indexing and all that, do to world science because a lot of that literature also is not um, in, included in that. The web of science, I think, includes nowadays about 12,000 journals in the world. We estimate that the number of journals in the world, uh, if you really look carefully, is probably more of the order of 70 or 80,000 dollars, 70 or 80,000 journals. And, uh, and there may be even more than that. There have been big debates about that, but it's much more than what Scopus or the Web of Science, or the, even the large bibliographies by disciplines, such as, say, the, the, the heir to the chemical abstracts and chemistry and so on, uh, uh, biological abstracts and so on, can offer. So this is what you do most of the time. The next thing is, that's what it becomes amusing, is when you put yourself, put your thing together, then you become a kind of intellectual dandy, you might say. You want to be beautiful. You want to be, you know, noticed. You want to be known. You want to somehow act like this elegant gentleman around the world. I thought of putting a picture of Oscar Wilde here because he was the great daddy of the late 19th century, early 20th century. But I'm saying this because when you publish your reaction, and you probably have been advised to do that by your own professors, is to find the right journal in which to publish in order to show yourself well. So if you can sneak an article in Nature, for example, that's the grand prize, uh, of course you, you are in a, you're doing something very well in this world of ours. And it looks like perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with that. No one seems to complain about it except me, uh, uh, because I think it's crazy. But that's the way it is. So suddenly you change persona, your befronts appears, you're no longer the solid, serious, and hardworking, not terribly well-dressed uh, detective here. And then suddenly you're really putting your little finger up in the air and you're saying, see, look at me, I'm doing well. Huh? And you're going to pay attention to me. And, uh, and this is what I would like to explore a bit more with you and see how, how all this came about. Now, the first thing we should say, uh, as first result, is that I must change the B-France picture. It's, it's not a symmetrical B-France. It's totally, totally different kinds of uh, persona. One is the hardworking. The other one is the person that tries to create a, a presence, an honored, authoritative, prestigious, if possible, presence uh, to, uh, toward a number of people particularly one's colleagues, of course, but these, they will know quickly whether you, you deserve or not. But the juries that uh, are going to give you grants to do further research, the juries, all the peers inside your university who are not in your discipline and yet are involved 
in uh, developing an evaluation of your career to promote you and, and perhaps to give you prizes in other, other situations. In short, you're being judged regularly by people who don't necessarily work in your field, understand your field, cannot approach it more than in a very general and uh, surface way, and they are going to play an important role in many aspects of your career, your persona, institutionalized persona in your society. And this is the, this is the kind of, of be friends you really are, the serious, hard-working guy on the left and the sort of feisty and uh, good-looking guy on the right who decides that he wants to be good-looking. Uh, that's what the scientist is like. So, let's summarize all that. A researcher needs, we've seen, access to information. He needs access to means of communication. He needs, he needs to make one's work visible, accessible, retrievable, usable, but also he needs, that's the default style, to be trusted, authoritative, and perhaps even prestigious. Okay? So, it's a lot of things to ask to the same person. Having only one front, one side, would be really a, a great handicap, I think, in this kind of world. So be prepared to grow a second face on your head. So to achieve all that, you can't do it alone. And a number of other players have been, act have been active in all of this to essentially construct, build this persona of the researcher. Librarians are involved in that, editors, have been involved because there is writing and you're going to be publishing and you need to put the, what you're going to publish in shape, in form, for an audience. And of course, those who clearly publish uh, these, these, uh, these documents that represent your contribution to knowledge. So, let's now look at how the situation was, say, up to the Second World War. So let's put ourselves roughly in the period that would extend from the 17th century when the journal, the scientific journal was invented with the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society of London and on the one hand and to some extent the Journal des Savants uh, in Paris. There were also publications about at the same time appearing in Italy with uh, for example around the Academia del Cimento and you, you have a whole uh, a, a whole uh, series of developments in the 17th century that begin to put in place the journal and article combination that are going to become very, very important uh, in the next, uh, essentially, three and a half centuries. I'm not going to go into that. I've covered that in earlier lectures in this uh, place. I've published things on that. But um, if you're really interested in this, go look at my paper called in Oldenburg's long shadow, it's also in open access, of course, and uh, you'll find it, and you can read that. You, it will put you to sleep very nicely, and uh, there are no, no secondary effects. You won't have to suffer from any secondary effects with that. So, what was the situation until, let's say, roughly from the late 19th century to 1945, 1950? Nearly a century. Things were changing slowly before, and we won't deal with that, but the, the last century, or that century I'm mentioning, is pretty stable. So, as I said, the situation was relatively clear. You had librarians in institutions who collected, collected the best information that they thought would be suitable, useful, relevant to their own institution and their researchers. So they tried to put things together to help the researchers with the kind of information that helps them best within their limits of money, time, and, and competence. They collected as much as they could of that. You had editors who were actually other researchers who were receiving submissions of articles from scientists who were trying to do the best choice of these, uh, of these articles while discussing with the um, authors uh, to try and improve the papers in some cases. Note in passing that I'm not talking about peer review. There was this sort of informal peer review done very often 
between an editor and maybe a couple of his colleagues who were taking care of the journal that you had submitted and the author or authors. In that period of time, most articles were still single author or sometimes two authors, rarely more than that, but not in the present situation of multiple authors. And as for publishers, well, they took care of the mechanics of this whole thing. They were offering and selling services to print, to buy, to send to uh, bookstores, sometimes to organize a subscription system. But they were not, uh, they were not playing a very, very substantial role in, th in that. And for that whole period, actually, publishers were not terribly interested in scientific journals because not that many people were interested in scientific journals, only scientists by and large. And uh, you, can, you can hope to make much money with those journals. So by and large, the, the publisher is there on the margin, doing a bit of work to make a bit of money, but mainly actually uh, trying to establish a contact with a group of interesting, well-educated people to see if any of them might at some, case, at some time decide to write a book. Not articles, a book. And uh, people like Darwin, who wrote some articles, but their great contribution was in books. Ma most mathematicians, beside their own articles, wanted to write a compendium, a kind of a, you know, general approach to a large, large segment, a large uh, domain in mathematics. So publishers were already in the game, mainly because they were interested in producing books, not journals. And they were just uh, looking at the ways to keep good ties with the, the, uh, with the researchers. So, in effect, if I summarize all this, this leads to a really interesting situation, which we have lost. Which we have lost. You did work in relatively small institutions, universities and research centers, counted generally a few dozen people as researchers, nothing much more than that. This is not big science in that period of, of history as the director of Solar Prize would call it later. So you, you have a few researchers. In certain kinds of fields, they pretty well know each other, at least nationally, and sometimes even in neighboring countries. Europe is beginning to build a kind of sense of European science by exchanging some information from country to country. And it's largely national still. Languages are still, national languages are still largely being used. There are three dominant languages in that period of time already, <clears throat> but they are not exclusive of others. And in some fields, other languages appear beside those three. The three are German, English, and French. But you find Italian in quite a few fields. You find Russian in quite a few fields. You find a bit of Spanish, not much, but a bit of Spanish, and so on. But you do find you do find things which allow, for example, someone like Gregor Mendel. Who was, who was a, a Slovak, uh, Slovakian uh, researcher, a monk actually, but also a researcher, to publish in Slovakian, which of course didn't make, make his uh, research terribly visible to other people outside of Slovakia, but it was considered to be normal at the time. So these people know each other. A journal is generally controlled by a group of scientists. It's a society's journal. It's organized by associations. Some of them are bigger than others. Some of them have become, in fact, national societies and become quite powerful in their countries and res respective countries. But the journal reflects the moment when people from a particular field or subfield <coughs> decide, decide to expose themselves to their colleagues. And the journal is the tool of creation of a community. That's what really is important in the journal. It's a form of community building system in which the community extracts from the whole group what is considered to be the best, the best work done by that group. So that, this, I think, is, is a very important point to remember. The journal is the echo or the reflection of a community which could have identified itself almost nominally with a few dozens, or at worst, kind of at most, a few hundred people in the largest countries. And the, uh, 
the editors, as I've said, were just part of the community. They were, in effect, the gatekeepers of the community in order to extract out of that community, uh, as I said before, the best work. The, the tradition for that is, is very simple. The big academies that were set up by kings and princes in Europe all across the 18th century also worked that way. People would come and present, the academicians would come and present their work to their colleagues at the academy, and some of the works were published, not all. So you have, for example, in the French Academy, you have a double register of publications. You have the, what they call the history of the academy, where they summarize all that was presented to the academy, with very, very short summaries. And some of the papers are in the memoir, which are the uh, memoir is the, the, what we would call the article, even though in all the French, and uh, in that period of time, a memoir was uh, formerly a piece of work that you offered to the king, but that has been largely forgotten uh, in between, as you can well imagine. So until that period, and until the second, up to the Second World War, the communication system among scientists and researchers is largely controlled by societies, and these societies are essentially, you, you might say, managing the production and controlling the production of knowledge inside that society for the benefit of the whole society, for the benefit of interchanging societies abroad. That's where the European interchange began to build up. And the way to do it was quite simple for a society. They would create a journal precisely because with a journal they had four, five, six, or a thousand, four, five, six hundred or a thousand copies of their journal and they would barter their journal with the the issues of the, uh, the another society's journal in the same field. And in this fashion, we build a library for the members of the society. And you're going to say, well, who paid for the journal? Well, the members of the society. The scientists wanted to be part of a community, and they wanted to establish visibility where it counted with their colleagues and their specialists, and they would buy a, subs a subscription to the journal the subscription was meant to cover the cost of the production of the journal. And in, in that fashion, you had an extremely efficient way of producing journals, exchanging journals even across borders, establishing a system of, of projection of work by individuals to relevant groups. And in this fashion, science was working rather well. Well, there were a lot of holes, uh, tools that had to be developed to find these articles more efficiently than going in the town where the society's library might have been situated. And there, commercial publishers develop some interesting tools. They develop, particularly in Germany, a tradition of abstracts, a tradition of, uh, uh, of indexing and uh, bibliographic uh, listing of a number of journals. And in fact, at one point, uh, the Royal Society in London tried to do a general bibliography of all of science. They tried to be a bit, uh, a bit went over a bit, of, a bit too far for their own resources, but they did create a catalog of uh, European science based on, I think, on a total of over 3,000 journals all through the 19th century, which remains one of the best ways to find what was going on in science in the 19th century all across Europe, from Russia, from Russia to, the, to I would say, probably Portugal. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's an interesting fact in itself. So this is the nice kind of science that we have up to 1945. And in a, in a funny way, uh, even though we know size of, the size of science has changed a great deal since then, uh, the, um, this is the image that many of us, I suspect you, carry in your head. I mean, you want to do science because you want to produce knowledge. You want to have a nice career in science, sure. You want to have a good position in some good research center or university, fine. But you're thinking about your colleagues, you're, you're thinking about your, your, uh, the people that work in your field, and you maintain with these people a, a relationship which, although it's often presented as if it were pure competition, I'm going to come back to that, uh, also includes a hell of a lot of collaboration. You exchange information, you ask for information, you, you wonder if someone has been doing
doing work on this particular sub-problem that interests you. You do that all the time, I'm sure, and we've all done that in our own work, in our own way of doing things. So, thanks to these acolytes, you might call them of the scientists, you have now a, a series of tasks which are well defined. Thanks to the librarians, the research was accessible for a very long time, was retrievable because well organized, and it was of course usable. Thanks to the editors, the research of the researchers was trusted, authoritative, perhaps even prestigious to the extent that if you happen to be in a journal that is edited by one of the very big names in your field, someone who is who's established a lot of of uh, what you call this of, of, uh, of prestige himself or herself, you're, you're going to end up, uh, of course, benefiting from that fact that this is a person that selected you. It's like doing a doctorate with a very, very well known professor. Uh, when you go for a job, if you have a letter of recommendation from that professor, it helps. And that's, that's, but it all works in a very simple, direct uh, form of evaluation in which everything is pretty well aligned in terms of we're seeking the best possible quality for the production of science. We're trying to do that, all of us. Okay? And that, that I think, is uh, the message, the key we've got to keep in mind from the past. Now, after the Second World War, the whole thing changed. And changed really drastically and radically, even though it took 10, 15 years to really uh, begin to be apparent and actually almost a generation to be fully, fully transformed. The, the whole situation changed because, as you probably know, the Second World War revealed the extreme importance of science in war, but the atomic bomb being a rather uh, spectacular uh, proof of this thesis but many other fields of uh, technology were totally transformed by the, the complete mobilization of science and an application of science to, to all these fields. Think of uh, the radar, radar technology. Think of uh, uh, the, the way, uh, particularly in Germany, they, they essentially invented the ballistic missile in the Second World War and they, <clears throat> they had a radar system all across the occupied parts of Europe, um, which is, in fact, has been described as the prototype of what we have now for uh, for plane, uh, civil plane control over Europe uh, or the rest of the world. For that. Uh, we, you have the, the the jet plane that appears at the end of the, of the Second World War again in Germany, and so on and so on. I mean, there were there were so many inventions that made science absolutely the elephant in the room for anyone that wanted to have <coughs> policy, policy uh, in, <coughs> excuse me, responsibilities after the Second World War. So that when the Cold War begins almost immediately after the, the, the Second World War, that is essentially by 1948, the, the, the Cold War has started in earnest, um, every, every protagonist knows that science is going to be an extremely important part of that. So both the Soviet Union and the, um, the Americans and the West, to the extent that it, uh, Western European countries, to the extent that they were in a position to do some science after the destructions of the Second World War, they all ran headlong into research. And the amount of research that began to be created after the war grew extremely rapidly, with one consequence, immediate consequence, which was that the, uh, the, the societies just could not res respond anymore. For one thing, so many new researchers are coming into play that the sense of community got distended, weakened for one, at one level, and the journals just could produce that many articles. So it's at that point that commercial publishers began to say to themselves, there may be something there that we did not know existed before. We're going to try playing a more important role in that. But in the first phase, around, say, 1950 to about 1970, 
the doing scientific publishing for the commercial publishers remains a, an area in which you, s you keep on saying to yourself, what's in it for me? How much money can I make in this? And for about 20 years, it's not entirely clear how much money they can make. But, but something happened which is completely going to change that very fundamentally. It's the science citation index that Garfield invents in the 60s and which begins to, you might say, stick. Is by sticking, I mean, uh, it's being believed and followed by a wide variety of people, including scientists, including uh, science managers, including particularly librarians. And why do I say particularly librarians? Well, it's very simple. I told you librarians try to collect things from the outside, but things that are important for the local community. And so they know that they have a guy who does work there, the woman who does some work on that. So you push your efforts on these kinds of documentation to help these people. You know them. You know, you know where they're going, more or less. So you try to help them. You even, this was the old time, the old days in, in libraries, when right? the, the journals would come into the, uh, into the library, the librarian would send a note by internal mail to various researchers and say, in the latest issue of X, you will find an article that should be useful for your research. This is gone. <laughs> this is far gone. On the, what happened with the Science Citation Index is that Garfield was trying to do something quite amazing, which responded to the needs of interdisciplinary science. He was trying to track how ideas circulate across disciplines by tracking citations. And he wanted to do a kind of citation map of the whole of science. That was his fundamental and basic idea. Except that, practically, this was not possible. So he, he had to find a way to do a subset of that project and do it in such a way that it had meaning. So he tried to explain that if he took science in a, in a, uh, in a particular way, if you could look at science in a particular way, he could actually justify taking a small subset of the journals of the world and tracking the, the citations of the inside those <coughs> articles in, in those journals would be enough to cover the, what is really important in science. So with the computers of the time, that meant limiting himself at the time to about 1,500, 1, to 1,500 journals. And he began to find this argument that you could essentially look just at the important 1,500 journals and the rest was not all that important. So, I mean, you're going to say, how did he do that? Well, he did that, and it's really, when you think of it uh, retrospectively, uh, it's really amazing because it's almost like a fairy tale. He tells a tale in one of his very, very important publications of a bunch of uh, librarians getting into a room, a bit like this one, to discuss what articles and journals they're really interested in for their various institutions. And he explains that it's a summer day, the windows are open, and <laughs> suddenly a storm comes along, there's a thunderstorm, and the wind blows, the lights go off, everybody runs around looking for how to get the thing fixed. And meanwhile, the wind blowing blows all the papers around. And when the librarians come back in the room, they don't know where their sheets of paper are, but Strangely, everybody had roughly the same list of journals, says without proving it, uh, Garfield. So that means that indeed all the librarians de facto already knew a hidden truth in science. Actually, science is divided, the documentation of science is divided into two parts, a small part that counts and the rest that doesn't count. And he calls that core science and the core journal. <coughs> now the result of that, the result of that, was to um, create for the librarians who had never actually behaved the way Garfield thought they, they behaved, but it created for the librarians a kind of justification to orient their buying of subscriptions of journals along that list, since it seemed to be the core science, since it seemed that everybody else was doing it, nobody ever checked whether this was the case really, uh, everybody began to buy. 
the subscriptions to the core science journals, independently of whether local scientists were doing or not. And that meant that at that point, a small subset of journals, say about a thousand or fifteen hundred titles, became for all fields the absolutely sine qua non uh, basis of a journal collection. Now you are now in a position that the publishers are beginning to look at with great interest because if all these silly librarians all behave without verifying that everybody needs the same core journals and they are all buying those core journals and by then they've exhausted most, if not more than their budget, that means that you've just created what the economists call an inelastic market. You know. So an inelastic market, I remind you, is a market where whatever the price is, you have to get it because you do. there is no choice. You have to get it. You know, you know. They say in the basic pop human population, bread creates at some level an inelastic market because to survive, human beings must eat perhaps about a kilo of bread per day. So you 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 have uh, you have an inelastic market, and then the publishers who, because of the growth of research after the Second World War had started exploring and were playing with various systems of doing, uh, doing uh, publishing in science in journals, suddenly see if we can put our, our journals or if we can acquire journals that are already in the set of the core journals that uh, Garfield has identified, now we can start having fun. And that's exactly what happened. They started buying journals from societies by offering them great, great, uh, uh, actually, inducements so that they could find that their work uh, was uh, what could be supported financially very easily. They started creating their own journals to make their own journals be better uh, accepted in the core sites. They go through a, an ostensible rigorizing of the peer review process, and the commercial publishers actually largely invent the modern form of peer review, which is the editor sends the, uh, the article to two or three people, sometimes anonymously. Uh, the, the peer reviewers are anonymous, but the article can be anonymized, uh, sometimes it's not. Now, just to make you uh, understand how new this thing is, it was done a little bit before the Second World War. And one of the people that uh, it, had, it was done to was, you know, this very minor scientist called Albert Einstein. So he sent an article to an American journal of physics, and he receives one day a letter with a, the comments of two other physicists about this article. And Einstein sends a letter back to editor, imagine that nowadays, saying, I don't know where you got the idea that you had the right to send my article to two other people. Besides these two people, I can demonstrate that here. the comments are completely stupid. Uh, uh, but I didn't, uh, I didn't send you my article because of uh, uh, this sort of thing. I thought your journal was a good journal. I thought you thought I was a good scientist. And I thought we could agree on that and you could publish my article. You know? That's in the 30s. By 1955, 60, 65, the peer review process that we know is becoming uh, absolutely, absolutely common. And the commercial publishers then impose themselves in yet another way. The society's uh, journals, although they were supported by the subscriptions and the, of the members and, and, and so on, um, generally had very strict rules about how long an article could be and how much they could uh, accept pictures and so on. And they had generally all of them, or nearly all of them, they had rules about what is called nowadays page charges. And people sending an article with a lot of graphs, photos and all that had to pay extra to get the article uh, published. As they had to pay extra, the article was too long, more than six or eight pages. So the publishers who knew that with this inelastic market, we could ask about anything. They began to say to authors, oh no, you don't need to pay page charges with us. Now, where do you think authors go if they have the choice? And the, the commercial journal is beginning to acquire a certain reputation of its own as a decent journal. 
it has a good editor, it has and so on. By the way, the publishers also start paying the editors. You know, that, that sort of thing. So you start seeing the, the, all the financial dimension of the journal taking, being foregrounded, being, taking a, an ever greater importance and creating new dynamics in the way in which these journals are managed, are disseminated, are promoted, and how, how they face the befront scientists that I've been describing from the very beginning. So this is, this is the, uh, if you want, the, 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 the stage that is being set at, uh, at that time. And what, what we observe is that from 1970 on, a phenomenon is noticed by the librarians. It's called the serial pricing crisis in the United States. The prices of journals just fly through the roof. Increases that go way beyond inflation, generally about 10% above inflation. And another thing that we start noticing is that fewer and fewer journals are being subscribed to by individuals. It's too expensive. So all the, all the transactions between journals is now limited essentially to publishers and librarians. And that creates a very strange situation because the scientists themselves are no longer part of the economic cycle of the journals. They are re their readers or they are trying to publish in the journal, but they don't participate in what is the sustaining lifeblood of the journal, money, and they, uh, they don't even feel the pain when the money, the journals uh, go up in price, they're just put, pushed aside. So you have now these deep transformations of the publishing world appearing between, say, 1950 and 1975. By 75, the system is well developed as it is nowadays, and it's working uh, in, that, uh, in that fashion that we know. Now let's look at how commercial publishers work. This is the, the, the topic of slide, they compete for market share, which is numbers of subscriptions. And they, to do that, they sell that to, uh, to libraries. So the, the idea uh, is to try and get really good relationships with the libraries and induce them to buy your journals. And they also have to organize the whole knowledge production system in such a way that it's going to put their journals in uh, a competitive advantage. What do I publish which makes my journal better than others? Better being, of course, the key word, but how are we going to define better? Tough problem. If you think of the, say, the chemical societies of Russia, Germany, France, Italy, and England in the 19th century, which journal was the best of those four or five countries? Maybe on, the, on average, because the Germans had more chemists, maybe their journals ten, in chemistry tended to be a bit richer or a bit more substantial than in the other countries. But even there, once in a while, you had a series of articles in another country, in another journal, which would have left everybody else in the dust. So, you, you, you know, it's, a, it's a, an issue in which the quality of individual works by individual scientists has nothing to do with a, a, a mythical notion of the quality of a journal. What we had in the 19th century were reliable and trustworthy journals. We had journals that were better known than others, but no one was talking about quality. Now with the, the publishers who are commercial and who are trying to conquer a market share, they're going to conflate all of that into a new, a new system. And the best way is to try and make the very dynamics of the knowledge production system make it fit with the, uh, the commercial interest of these journals. And to do that, they, uh, they are going to need, they are going to create a form of competition among scientists, which has become the rule. So that scientists nowadays, when you think about, when you talk to them, and you probably have heard that yourself, so what do you do when you do scientific work? You compete against your colleagues. You've got to be the best. You don't want to be second best. You want to be the best. But how many the best is there in the world? One. So what do we do with the 
millions of scientists who live in the world. If they only the best count, does science work with only the best? Can science work with only the best? Of course not. This is totally mythical and totally, you know, totally absurd. So, to achieve all of that, the journals and commercial publishers are going to invent a, a really diabolical tool, which is the impact factor. Now, I don't know how many of you know about the impact factor. Do you, do you know about the impact factor? Are you, are you obsessed by the impact factor? <laughs> do you know why there are three decimals in the impact factor? No? You don't know? Anybody has an idea why there are three? Have you ever asked yourself why there were three decimals in the impact factor? I mean, you're scientists, aren't you? Don't you, uh, don't you pay attention to the number of decimals to your measurements when you do measurements? Yeah, and it seems to be pretty important, you know. I mean, if you measure, if you measure a, a, let's say, a sprint racing track uh, of 100 meters to the nearest meter, um, you're going to have some people really shrinking at you because that's not a, a level of uh, precision that is uh, acceptable for that. Now, do we need the three decimals of precision for the impact factor? Well, Garfield says yes. I asked him. I queried him on that. And he said, well, yeah, between you and me, I think one decimal is probably enough. We didn't know how to justify one decimal either. Just sort of admitted that three was probably pushing the envelope too far. But sort of, a, you know, yeah, one decimal probably is enough. And then he gives a lecture about six months after I query him. And he, he explains, he explains in his, in his lecture why we need three decimals. And we need them because we, if we didn't have three decimals, you might end up with a very un unhappy result for a competition. You might have two journals with the same impact factor. Oh my god. Two journals with the same impact factor. That's going to... I mean, the public is not going to be happy. Imagine when you have too many... You, know, you have too many uh, people who have the same timing in a race. The race becomes boring, right? That's not what you want. So, you go to the next stage just to make sure that everybody is rigorous, rigorous, I can't pronounce it, rigorously ranked. Rigorously? What it means is strictly ranked in ways which are not rigorous. Okay? It's, uh, it's, it's a crazy, totally crazy, crazy thing. And the, uh, the role of the journal being ranked then begins to be completely, completely itself uh, uh, <clears throat> involved in a series of operations which really should leave any good scientist scratching his or her head, asking you know, himself or herself, what the hell is going on here? One of my colleagues has been doing a study of the impact, individual impact, calculated like the impact factor, but article by article of inside journals and has demonstrated that the distribution of the impacts of articles within journals is an absolutely anything but a Poisson distribution. It's really a Pareto or Lotka kind of, a, of a distribution, which means that if you take an average of that sort of distribution, it is meaningless. That's what the impact factor relies on an average over two years of the citations picked up by a particular article over that period of time, two years. So you have, you have a, a system which not only <clears throat> does a crazy classification of journals, but then, then it is done on the basis of a mathematical operation, which is not even legitimate for this kind of distribution. So that's the first problem that you have <clears throat> with that. The second thing is that because it's right, because the journals are right, the assumption is that they are ranked by quality. Who said? <clears throat> Suppose you have a special issue on, in a journal uh, at the right moment about cold fusion. You may remember this episode in the history of physics and chemistry when two researchers from the University of Utah in, uh, in the United States claimed that they had detected fusion-like uh, phenomena in, uh, in test tubes at uh, room temperature, which was of course pretty exciting because if it had worked, I mean, you could do you could do fusion uh, 
in your kitchen. Um, so, uh, of course, it didn't last very long. But suppose you do a, a, a series of work following up on this particular thing in a special issue. That thing is going to be cited like hell. Is that good quality work? Well, maybe people there are doing good refutations of the things that would be useful. But, you know, you're, you're, get, you're getting into a series of, of questions which really show that the impact factor, really, if it measures anything, which in my opinion it doesn't even do, but if it should even try to measure anything, would actually uh, would measure something like visibility, or, uh, you know, sort of, uh, oh yeah, it's being talked about a lot in some circles. Uh, yeah, then you might have something which is not too, too poorly off base, but it's certainly not related to quality. So that's, that's the second fallacy around impact factors. And the third fallacy is that I've talked so far only about journals. <clears throat> the, the impact of the articles is contained in journals, in a way to rank journals, and then you've, you wrongly try to create a, a, an index of quality based on this ranking. But then you extend that to everything. A researcher is going to be judged by where he publishes, not by what he publishes, not how good what he publishes, but where he publishes. You manage to sneak a bad article into nature, and bingo, you are, you are a great scientist for a while. Uh, <clears throat> the Memory of Water was an article published in Nature. Now, the Memory of Water was a piece of work which was supported by the, some pharmaceutical industry to try and demonstrate that home homeopathic medicines really work. There was, a, there, was a, uh, uh, there was really something to it as a doctor colleague of mine, you know homeopathy is not pissing in the Seine in Paris and drinking the water at the, in the, at, the, uh, at the mouth of the, of the Seine River. Uh, you're not going to could do the same with the Po River. Uh, and it doesn't give you, uh, you know, much of a, much of a, of a, of a reaction by now, you know. Um, so, you have, you have uh, people being judged by where they publish, which means <clears throat> most people want to be published Jan Janus B. France in those journals. So they're going to do about anything they can to demonstrate to the editors, especially when you have rejection rates of 90% or even higher, uh, that, you know, I'm talking about something important, something that's really hot, something that's really great, and it's really new, and it's really wonderful, and so on and so forth. And they're going to sometimes perhaps push the evidence a bit further than uh, what they have. And studies recently have demonstrated that there is a rather positive correlation statistically about the impact factor of a journal and <clears throat> the retraction number, the number of retractions uh, mentioned in its journal. So the impact factor is actually a very good predictor of retractions. You know, maybe that's its major, its major use right now in our society. It creates a way to, uh, to predict how people are going to probably retry things from that journal. So, the new situation now is quite changed. Instead of access to information, which was done quite clearly, either by subscribing to a few journals yourself because they were cheap, or going to the library because you couldn't subscribe to everything, now publishers dominate the whole area and librarians become simple, you might say, consumers of an inelastic market where they have to, to, uh, to do the, 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 the selection. And all this is going to be even intensified, and that will be shown in the next slides, uh, when we get to digitization, of course. Uh, access to means of communication? Now, commercial publishers monopolize that. They used to be on the sideline. They used to sell their services to finally push the paper into the libraries, the bookstores, and the, through the post office. But no, now they monopolize most of these publications. And uh, they, they control the access to means of communication. You want to publish your article, your precious work, you're going to have to submit to a journal, which with a fair probability will be a journal controlled by one of these guys. You want to make your work visible, accessible, retrievable, usable? Isn't that what you want to do? That's what I want to do. 
Well, and now all this is defined in constrained by publishers. And in particular, by the fact that now prices are going through the roof. Although you want the maximum number of people to have access to your articles, the price is going to limit access to those articles in the places where they can buy the subscriptions to the journals. You want uh, to be trusted and authoritative? Well, that has changed meaning, my friends. Now, you know, there is no more longer trust and authority except that which is resting on top of the impact factor. Being trusted and authoritative means being having an article in the in a journal with high impact factor. I, I had a young colleague, <clears throat> the one I was in fact citing the other a few minutes ago about the distribution of the citations inside a, a given journal, the impact of the distribution of the impact of the articles to be precise. His name, you may have seen his name if you're interested in those issues. His name is Vincent Larivière, he's a fellow from Quebec in Montreal. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, he published one article, it may in fact be the article uh, in Nature. And he said to me one day, being really being, he said, hey, when you publish in Nature, hey, hey, things really happen. Well, he was getting interviews on the radio, interviews on the television, interviews at the university, he was in the front page of the local rag. Uh, I mean, he was, uh, he was the big star for a week, you know? And uh, that's what's happening with this kind of, of things. People are sort of <clears throat> pushing in the same direction. And the thing that's probably the least discussed, but so important, is publishers, in many cases, even have a say in choosing the editors of the journals. Why? Because in produce, creating journals, or buying journals from societies, they often manage to control the title of the journal. They own the title. So that if they're not in agreement with the editorial board or the editors, they just can sack the whole editorial board and replace it by somebody else. This has happened recently between the big company called Elsevier and, uh, uh, and the... Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the editors of a journal which was called Lingua, which is a journal in linguistics. They wanted to organize the, uh, the, the financing of the journal differently. They wanted to make it more open access. Of course, Elsevier didn't want that because it would have decreased their, uh, their revenue and their profit uh, from that journal. So they, uh, they refused. And the only, the only choice these people had, because Elsevier owned the title Lingua, was to create another journal and try to make it to compete against Lingua. Now, locally in, in, uh, in linguistics, it's a relatively uh, self-aware community, which means that that editorial board, which really had the support of a, really the good linguist, the best linguist in the world, has managed so far to go on and recreate a journal which is doing relatively well for the moment. But already that new journal, because it is not, no longer part of Elsevier, is having much, many more problems in terms of, of finances. And the Elsevier journal is just waiting and sitting pretty until, uh, I suppose, uh, Glossa, because the new journal is called Glossa, they went from Latin to Greek. Um, Glossa hits a financial crisis, and then they probably will say, what well, would you like to come back with us? Our finances. So, you have now the next big shift of oh, digitization. And open access is a child of digitization. Why? Because to do open access, you cannot do it if the marginal cost of creating an extra copy of your paper and the marginal cost of shipping that copy around is not nearly zero, um, open access becomes extremely difficult financially unless it's totally subsidized at a very high level by, by some public entity which uh, you know, particularly nowadays uh, is, not, is not going to be uh, very, very uh, probable. So 
with, with, uh, with this came uh, open access and the way to interpret the open access which begins with a number of experiments I was involved in those myself back in 1991 but they started in some corners around 89, 90 uh, because young researchers, not so young researchers in my case we're trying to, uh, we're trying to control uh, uh, and experiment with the new tools and see what they could do to redevelop means of communication that they could control themselves which could be part of the communities of, of researchers which could be part of the efforts of the institution which could be part, in fact, of the way for the, the institution to create visibility for itself in the world so it's, you could say open access emerged as a way to, I would say, make visible and possible a desire to regain control over the whole system of scientific communication. And that started, say, in 1990, to use, uh, to use uh, an easy, an easy uh, date to remember. So open access, essentially, is nearly 30 years old. It's not yesterday that it started. It's a generation ago already. And of course, what you might say is that why is it still not so developed nowadays? What's happening? What is it? So, at that point, the answer to my question is quite simple. From that point on, the contest developed between the publishers and those who wanted to develop this, regain control over the communication system of the scientific communication system. And it was a, a very, very harsh contest. It followed exactly, exactly uh, the rules that you probably know. First, they ignore you. Then, they laugh at you. And then, they fight you. In the fourth stage, and, and then they try to take you over. And make you, make you theirs uh, in a way that's compatible with the, the, their objectives. We are, we are in some way between three and four. We are between three and four. They fight, and at the same time they try to regain a full control over what open access should be like. To go very fast there, because we don't have the time today, what they want to do is to explore and the road of publishing in open access by having financing upstream of the articles. In other words, you have either the author or his or her institution or a funder or a governmental program paying for the cost of producing the articles. And the cost of the articles is calculated to maintain the revenue stream and in fact the benefits of the, of the publishers. And in fact, right now the publishers have found a very exciting solution in open access because they are still doing most of their business by subscriptions. You know, and I could go on how they've changed that too. You may have heard of the expression big deal, which is when a publisher will sell you for a discounted price all their journals. But that's important for them because then the journals being very readily accessible in an institution tend to be used more, cited more, and their impact factor goes up. And since it's the metric to understand what quality is, I don't have to go further, you, you understand the system. But the, uh, the, uh, nowadays what uh, publishers have developed is a sort of mixed system in which the same journal can appear both ways. It too is BFRONTS. A journal can be part of a subscription system, but at the same time can offer for the authors that want it, because they want to be more visible and more accessible, will offer to these authors the possibility of publishing their article in that subscription-based journal in open access. So they get the money from the authors, they get the money from the subscriptions, and that means they get an increased revenue from the journal. And for example, now practically every journal in Nelsonia and practically every journal in Springer are what is called a hybrid journal doing that. So you see how they're shaping open access and trying to craft it into a form which is anything but what the people who supported 
and have support with open access from the beginning wanted, what you have instead is a very clever commercial strategy to increase, maintain and increase and improve uh, profits. In passing, I remind you, if you don't know it, that a company like Elsevier, on its scientific publication, has a level of profit before taxes of the, of the order of 35%. 35%. And if you calculate that in the cost of, uh, of the production of those journals, you have things like supporting uh, meetings of librarians, publicity, all sorts of things, uh, lobbying, and so on and so forth. You can see that actually if you look at all the, the, the revenue stream of such companies versus the actual cost of production of these journals, it's not 35% that you should calculate, it's probably more like 50 or 55%. So in effect, you know, we pay with our public money in our universities and the libraries, we pay huge amounts of money for publications which we are giving away to them because when you submit your articles, you don't ask to be paid for your article. When you peer review the articles, you don't ask to be paid by the publisher. Either you do it because you, you feel you have to do it for the community. And meanwhile, the publisher is sitting on this system and lit literally raking in enormous amounts of, uh, amounts of money. So a contest has developed from the 90s, and particularly, particularly in the beginning of this uh, century, uh, between those people who wanted to develop open access and uh, the commercial publishers. So more recently, and that's going to be the, the end of, uh, of my talk, this battle has been fought around a few words because they reappear in the policy debates taking place, for example, at the European Commission in Brussels, but also in a number of countries uh, where, of course, um, minist ministries of research and higher education discuss these issues and are concerned by them. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to really quickly run through uh, four of them. Markets, sustain sustainability, competitive, and of course open access itself. Uh, here is the report, for example, that was published by, uh, by uh, uh, a, a consulting firm headed by a fellow named Johnson. And uh, which was uh, delivered to the European project, open access project, called Open Air. You may have heard of Open Air. Uh, it's spelled O P E N A I R E. And if you go into Google and you ask towards a competitive and sustainable OA market in Europe, the title that is on the slide here, uh, you will immediately find the report. And uh, if, if, my, if my papers put you to sleep, I guarantee this one will do an even better job, but it may also raise your blood pressure. So uh, it's uh, it's a pretty maddening report. So let's go back to these terms. Here is a phrase, a sentence about market, uh, which uh, immediately uh, you know shows that the whole thing is going in the wrong direction. The scholarly publishing market is an intermediate market. Now, what does that mean? Something extremely simple, the one I've mentioned before. Because of the ways the publishers develop their strategies in the uh, period after Garfield, <coughs> libraries were the sole buyers of these journals. They were too expensive for anybody else. And at that point, the, uh, the readers, the users of these journals, no longer paid directly for these journals. So people in the publishing industry said, Oh yes, we know it's a bit of a difficult world because you don't, you're not, the, the users don't really pay for the, the whole thing. So you know, you have to expect that there are some market difficulties. Uh, it's a question of tweaking the market to make it work better. Now, let me ask you a thing. Is it because we don't pay directly for the roads that the, the cost of maintaining or building the roads has gone, uh, is going through the roof? No. You know, you could, show all sorts of examples where the intermediate market exists without having this kind of uh, bad consequence. But I like this sentence even better. Market for, this is a, a sort of conclusion which is hidden somewhere in the report, page 53, 
to be precise, and it says market forces are unlikely to deliver either widespread open access or a competitive and sustainable market. The market is not capable of producing the market. Give me a break. What does that mean? The, 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 the monkey is not capable of biting its own tail, I guess, or something like that. I'm not quite sure if uh, who, what is doing what to whom and how and in according to what process, but it is clearly a situation which shows that using the notion of market in the area of scientific communication is not the right way to go. And why is that, is that so? For a very simple reason. Each article is unique. So when you want to look for information and you're looking for an article on a topic that is of interest to you, every bit of information you'll find in the literature will tend to be unique. So you might say that, in effect, an article, a scientific article, is a monopoly above, above a small piece of knowledge. A journal is just a collection of small monopolies over small pieces of knowledge. A big publisher is a collection of journals itself being a series of monopolies over small bits of knowledge. So that the, essentially the publisher, in the last analysis, has the economic position of asserting monopoly power. And that's the reason why the whole notion of market is really a fig leaf that publishers themselves keep on dandying about to hide the fact that they don't want a market, there is no market, there is only information that has to be shared and being distributed. And that's why it's not working very well. Sustainability, now this is quite funny because uh, the libraries will say, you know, the present subscription model is not sustainable. Why? Well, because the, our budgets simply don't, uh, are not big enough and the governments or our institutions don't have the money to give us uh, the means to buy all these publications. You are not sustainable. Response of the publishers. Oh, well, this is because in the last 20 years, the fraction of the budget of a university, this is true in North America at least, as uh, the, the, the fraction of the budget of a university that has uh, been uh, developed um, around uh, uh, acquisitions of information has gone down. It used to be maybe 5%, it's now 3%. Go back to 5% and you'll have the right kind of money to buy our stuff. There's no problem. Just pay, just get more money and then pay for it. Uh, there's no problem. So that's the sustainability really changes meaning uh, when you, you, you criticize one side uh, for another. On the side of the publishers, uh, sustainability really means the need to maintain a healthy, that's very often the, the, the sentence used, a healthy, a healthy uh, revenue stream, which, uh, without which, this is a term used in a report by Mark Ware for the uh, research councils of the United Kingdom, uh, be, without which these uh, publishers would become brittle. They can't innovate. The poor people, they need 35% interest, profit, in order to be able to innovate a little bit. Actually, the publishers, the funny thing is that these big publishers have, have been the least innovative enterprises in, in this whole thing. You ask them then, uh, well, not to be brittle, what level, what level profit do you want? And when you ask that point blind to a publisher, the answer, again in the Mark Ware report, says, oh, well, uh, in a market situation, there is really no way to define excessive profit. There is no way to define excessive profit. So presumably, we could be in a situation in which 300, 400% profit would be perfectly legitimate. Now we've seen things like that happen, we know it, in other, other areas. The pharmaceuticals in markets which are not well regulated by governments make people pay through the nose for uh, drugs which sometimes have been produced for years and therefore there is no innovation or no, nothing in there. Uh, you compare the prices of drugs in New Zealand with the prices of drugs in the United States, 
you'll see a huge difference, and it's not in favor of the United States, I can tell you that. So, sustainable is bringing the eye of the beholder. And uh, I, I could have said, uh, I could say multi as well, but uh, open access, I've already alluded to that, has, is being shaped in a particular way by those publishers uh, in, a, in, a, in a strange uh, in a strange way with the APCs, the article page chargers, and the and the hybrid journals, and you could also demonstrate the, that the word competition has been manipulated by the publishers uh, to include, in fact, a, a, a system of rankings with the world rankings of the universities, world rankings of journals, world rankings of the researchers through the journals, which means that. The only ones who can define the currency of evaluation in the world nowadays is are the uh, the uh, those publishers. With open access, one of the stakes is to try and recreate independent means of evaluating, of developing what is called symbolic capital for researchers without having to rely on such tools. Thank you very much. Said that uh, Hans, the, the journal were a uh, kind of output uh, of, a of a community of scientists that used to produce a journal to spread their knowledge, their discipline. But <coughs> do you think it would be better to come back to this form of uh, dissemination or uh, through the impact factor and uh, the most ranked journal? Would be possible for these scientists to get uh, to be more uh, in, more known and to get a better distribution uh, for other field of research and for other scientists. Well, I, I, I didn't have time today to develop this uh, this whole issue, but I think there is a strategy to go back to the 19th century, if I may say so, with um, uh, the use of libraries. It's called, to go very quickly, it's called the inside-out library. And the concept of inside-out library is that the library inside, say, the Polytechnical, instead of trying to gather everything that's needed for people inside Polytechnical, gathers, on the contrary, everything that's done within Polytechnical and exposes it in open access with the right kinds of metadata, and the right kinds of evaluations, and the right everything, saying this is what we produce at Polytechnico, and this is the best. Now, of course, if Polytechnico does that alone, that's not terribly good. You, you've lost access to everybody else, and not everybody might be interested by what Polytechnico does. But if you have a network of libraries at the level of a, a continent, like Open Air can do it with the European continent, and does that with four or five hundred institutions, then it becomes like a huge, a huge library in open access where actually everybody's pumping outside uh, the best that they are offering, thereby behaving very much like the societies of the 19th century, but on a much larger scale, and using the money of the libraries to support this thing. So instead of paying the big publishers, you would be paying to produce these things. Now, to make that work, what you have to do is create a transition phase um, at the level of evaluation. And that's going to be a very difficult thing, because there are winners and losers in that. You're going to have people who are benefiting from the present system, because they manage to insert themselves in the impact factor ranking game. And they're not going to want to lose that. They want to play that, they play it well, they know how to do it, and they don't care what the consequences are, their personal benefits are not good. It's at that level that the managers of, uh, of science, that is actually the presidents of, of, of universities and the uh, rectors and the rest of the directors of, of labs, have to come together and say, we are going to evaluate differently. And we're going to evaluate within this uh, broader this kind of um, network, like an open air based network of institutions. And in fact, the only competition that really makes sense in, in science is against oneself. That is to say, here is how we work this year, and we've done this, and we've managed to do that, and people have thought this was pretty good. 
but we must do it even better next year. But this is, I think, the, the only thing. Otherwise, think also, the, I, I, I did not develop all the problems with the impact factor, but you, can, you could write a book about that. But one of, them, one of the problems with the impact factor is that because journals select problems which are going to attract readers in a certain circle, and because the, there is a kind of, you might say, convergence on hot topics at certain moments of the history of science, what you end up doing is pushing aside anything new or really innovative, which may not be understood at first, which may be very, very uh, controversial at first, which may be uh, so deep and so profound that uh, you know, people say, what do we do with this thing? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you end up, in fact, ensuring that science is going to sterilize itself in terms of not innovation and go uh, always in the same directions with safe, quick, rewarding kinds of problems that allow you to, to get quickly uh, your, your, uh, your publications, and etc., which will ensure you're getting the grants, getting the promotions, getting the students, get, you, know, you know the game. And, uh, and this, this, I think, is uh, really one of the grave, grave problems uh, of this kind of, of system. With the system that uh, I am I'm sort of advocating, of kind of going back to the 19th century, but through the libraries, probably uh, allying themselves with the university presses in terms of the skills and services that you need to produce a good website, produce uh, you know, the, the kinds of uh, presentation of documents uh, to for readers, um, I think we can clean up and do a really, really good job uh, in, the, in the future, but it's going to require evaluating our, our researchers differently. If, you, if we continue to say uh, um, to researchers, give us, for example, Harvard says something which is intelligent, but not sufficient. Uh, give us for the promotion phase in your entry, give us at the, at the moment of evaluation the five best articles you've written. Okay. But the five best articles someone has written is going again to be evaluated by where it was published, not by what it was published, by what, what was published. Walport, the former director of the Welcome Youth in the Foundation, the Welcome Trust that pays for about a billion, billion pounds, I think, of, uh, of research every year. I heard him say one day, we should send the submissions for grants uh, to the juries with articles which do not show which journal they come from. Now, of course, people could quickly retrieve the, the right title of the journal, but maybe enough would not, would not spend the time or waste their time doing that to really address what's in the article, to, uh, to see uh, perhaps quality come back to the fore and then the succession of writings. <clears throat> but open access uh, is helping there. Open access is also helping in the whole area of data. I didn't address that at all today, but pushing out the data when it's possible, uh, relating the data to the articles, allowing greater ability to reproduce work and verify work. An immense amount of work in science is never verified, really. You know, it's in the sense of redoing the experiment. It's, there, is no, there is no symbolic value in redoing an experiment. Unless you're really convinced that there is something wrong there, and, uh, you, can, uh, you can get some symbolic value from that. But it's the rare case where it's obvious from the start. So, you know, all these things show that we are pushing a very big worldwide machine of knowledge production, which is really put on very, very bad wheels. Very bad wheels. And it's, uh, it's a pre preoccupation of mine and many other people, because this is the best knowledge we produce, and we are not producing it the right way. Other question? I have one last one. Uh, how can we break up the English dominance in uh, academic publication? Yeah, that was another, by the way, that was also Garfield's doing. When he did uh, this subset of core journals, 
he gave enormous privilege to English language journals. So suddenly, the only quality journals were in English. <laughs> That's, uh, that created a rather interesting situation. And uh, as you know, many, many institutions in the world have decided to publish in English because of that. Now, I have an ambivalent reaction to that. Um, the, my ambivalence is that I enjoy the fact that if a Korean publishes something in the field I'm interested in, I can read it, because I only have to read English. And uh, even though I'm a native French speaker, I don't, I don't have to worry about, uh, about that. I know two languages, and that's essentially enough. You know. On the other hand, um, this, this way of organizing scientific publishing has, again, contributed, not caused, but contributed to homogenizing the field of questions that people can raise, which means we're leaving all sorts of questions fallow, not being answered to, not being treated. That leads to a well-known phenomenon, for example, in uh, medicine, where people talk about uh, uh, neglected diseases. Uh, let's take an example, the Zika virus. Do you know when it was discovered? 1947. When was, it the, when was it studied a bit seriously? Three years ago. Why? Just starting to touch Florida. Okay. Uh, the Ebola virus was discovered in the 70s. There it's even worse because immediately people knew it was extremely lethal. You know, you lost somewhere between a third and a half of your population when you had an epidemic. The only thing that happened for years was that whenever there was a, a small epidemic starting someplace, it was never talked much about, you isolated the village and threw food over the, the fence, so to speak, and let people fend for themselves. And when the thing had, expo had essentially uh, exhausted itself, you, you reopened with half of the population gone. Uh, the, the rationale was that we don't know how to solve Feel that. And at the world level, it was, well, these are African lives, who cares? It took the crisis two or three years ago, when finally 11,000 people got killed. And uh, some people from Europe and from North America began to be sick with this thing. Oh, oh, wait, this is becoming dangerous. So now we start looking at it a bit more and working at it. Within, within two years, there were already uh, potential vaccines being tested. This thing had been going on for 40 years. But as long as it only kills a few Africans, who gives it that? You know? it's, it's really, to me, I mean, it's uh, absolutely unacceptable, this sort of thing. But that's, that's what happens with the role of English uh, contributing to homogenizing the issues. So that leads to, uh, I think, the importance of recreating linguistic communities, particularly for the kinds of problems that are important for that community or that region, uh, and which uh, are being neglected by the so-called international science. We have all sorts of, uh, of, of problems in agriculture, in medicine, and so on. For example, in Latin America or in Africa, which could be which could be uh, treated in the case of Latin America in Spanish and Portuguese. And, well, uh, who knows? I mean, in treating all these neglected problems in some fields where you really have a variety of problems that emerge depending on where you live, uh, you might end up having to work with concepts in such a way that these concepts would benefit. But there is a very good example of how bad science is doing that, is at doing that. There was a doctor named Sambunath D, um, a, an Indian, who worked as a doctor uh, in Calcutta, as it used to be called, I forget the name now, but as a new name, <laughs> or rather it has its own name again. Um, and Sambunath D had done its uh, doctorate in England and gone back to, to India. And in India, not surprisingly, given the situation there, he was working on cholera. Now in Italy or in Western Europe or in North America, cholera 
We haven't seen that for a century and a half. Why should we worry about that? That's good for Haitians, not for us. Uh, but in doing his work, Sanguinate uh, developed a theory about the, uh, the danger of cholera and its uh, ethology, uh, uh, and, uh, which was completely different from what had been developed in the classical literature. And thanks to the help of some colleagues in the United States and in Britain, he even managed to uh, publish that in Nature. So it got good support and for what a non pop problem was being published in uh, Nature. For 15 years, the publication by Sabunade Batkar was completely disregarded everywhere in the world. Completely disregarded. And the reason was that it's not a doctor from Calcutta that can pretend to refine and re revise and, and improve our theory of cholera and its lethality, uh, etc. And Garfield studied that uh, case because he wanted to understand by his citations uh, why some papers are not uh, sometimes used very quickly. Finally, it got used, and Samunadi was recognized more than 15 years later, I think after his death, actually, uh, that, uh, that he was right and his, uh, his, his work was really important. And all Garfield could say after doing a very sophisticated citation analysis of the articles, of the other articles citing Sambu Day, was that, oh, here we have a typical case of delayed recognition. Well, you know, in Molière, the French playwright, he explains things that put people to sleep with the, what he calls the dormitive, the dormitive virtue of the drug. I think we have the dormitive value or the citational uh, value of, of, the, of the article, or virtue or whatever. So the, the citational virtue of an article is meaningless, obviously. What ha was happening is that something that they was happening to write in English, in a, in a prestigious journal, on a topic which for the dominant communities of science uh, reading nature was of no importance. So linguistically I think it's important to reopen uh, spaces, so to speak, of autonomy uh, to allow researchers in, say, in Italy or in any place to, to tackle problems which may be of great or even modest local importance but which are scientifically interesting and, uh, and which could be helpful to the local country. We're going back, in effect, to my library serving its constituency. We're going back to the scientists serving the local population in some ways. And if the work done by these people is uh, conceptually useful and important, that work, that work may well uh, and very simply nourish the, the theoretical work in science, so that also is, uh, is important. Essentially, you broaden the base of cases you study with the hope that the scientific pyramid can go higher. And for that, I think a bit of linguistic, uh, a bit of linguistic uh, diversification can be very helpful. Especially nowadays with the modern tools of, uh, in science, the modern tools of automatic translation and digitization you get a sense, you may, you may want to go further if you think the thing is really important to you, but you get a sense whether a piece of work can, what a piece of work means and whether you can use it or not for your own work. So we, why, why uh, enforce, so to speak, a, a policy of publishing in English uh, is to me a, the wrong way to go. It's useful, but it shouldn't be pushed too far. <coughs> that would be my argument. And it can be, it can be, I think, legitimized uh, in, in very simple ways. Very simple ways. So, uh, does that answer your question? Anything else? You're exhausted by now. <laughs> when I was coming after, a, a, you know, a superhero of a conference, Bruce Stern is a superb lecturer. So I was, I was telling myself, I have a tall order in front of me to talk to you after the bruise. So, thanks for your attention. Thank you.